operators also choose locations. But for the entire Dallas Fort Worth Metroplex, Panera has, uh, has ranked every potential intersection that has a certain amount of this criteria that, that sort of is on the radar. So you know, Phosphor may not be on the radar because it's just so low on some of these ingredients that it just doesn't register yet. So they prioritize all these intersections. Um, and they've developed basically um, a priority on each one of the intersections that, that, that they're not in yet and based on kind of a buffer uh, distance between their locations. And they actually go into each one of those individual trade areas or, or um, uh, opportunity areas and start looking at real estate and score the real estate within that intersection and prioritize the position of where they want to be within, within that intersection. And in, if the number one or number two position, maybe number three position is not available, then they constantly continue to monitor it. So it may not be the fact that Panera doesn't want to be in Louisville, but in essence, the kind of the A plus location, the corner where they want to be, just doesn't have any availability yet. And so they're, they're, you know, they're, they're working on other intersections that has the A location that can deliver the performance that they're looking for. Lower hanging fruit. Lower hanging fruit. Well, and two, uh, if you go back to the science um, that um, when we were doing work with Walgreens or you know, Walmart or Target, because it's so data driven and they have so many store locations, they're able to actually predict what they're going to do performance wise and store with a plus or three, plus three or four percent of margin of what they actually open the door. So they have they have very accurate store forecast. And so it may be if they go to that third tier location or fourth tier location in, in Louisville their impact on sales is going to be so significant that there's another location that they can just get a higher return on their investment in, in another location where that, that A opportunity is. That's another example. Target used to be on one side of the freeway, right. mm -hmm. and then they moved to the other side of the freeway. We always kind of assumed, we didn't really know, we assumed it was more of a cost issue than a store location demographics <coughs> issue. But we weren't really sure. Target's interesting because they actually can create or ship the market. So they're, they're more of a destination user. They just need to be kind of in the middle of about 120,000 people. And so moving from one side of the intersection to the other, people will make that adjustment. So Walmart and Target have the luxury of being able to. It was, it was more than that, though. They went from Target to Super, super Target. Right. Yeah, that's true. Right. That's true. They needed to grow, so that's why they moved across right. the way. And on the west side, it's congested. I've actually put a store on the west side years ago, and it's congested. And just to go back a bit, what, what Jason was saying about the real estate with Panera, it's absolutely true, because what would happen in the real world is Jason, being my broker, would say, hey, this, this property opened up, because I would have given Jason the instructions, when, when these open up, let me know, because I'm working nationally trying to fill my gaps. And if Jason calls up and says, hey, that one location, we can get something there, if I'm going to say, oh, let's look at it, that means I'm going to start spending money on it. A little bit of money, but I'm going to start, so I have to, I have to plug it into my system, and so that's why we have people like Jason, broker developers, who have their thumb on what's going out there. So I think if you're going to go pursue retail or start to look at retail, it's, it's really a good idea to understand where the consumer is today. One of the best reads on, um, we're all trying to figure out where the, where, what the new consumer looks like, and, and where, where are we going, and what are their shopping patterns, and. And you know this post-recession consumer hasn't quite settled out yet, um, but uh, one of the better reads on on this that, that I, I think really nails it well is a, a, a published article um, called the Darwinian Gale. So if you're interested in the subject, um, Google Dar Darwinian Gale, and um, it's a it's a fairly simple read, but a good read. But um, right now, if if, if I want to buy um, something, I can type in my iPhone and find you know where it is in stock and where the cheapest price is and I can decide do I want to order it online and have it shipped to my door or do I want to go over to you know, Vista Ridge Mall because it's close and they have three in stock. And so consumers have extreme information on price, availability, and so as you're, as you're merchandising your market you have to think of long term where the consumer is going and, and, and what is availability and um, you know, where you can be competitive in the bricks and mortar and then how really this internet platform um, is going to compete with your shopper. I think the, the bricks and mortar is going to continue to be relevant for a number of reasons, but you certainly have to understand what the consumer has and where they're armed and, and what you have available. And have you guys looked into or have you, have you thought about, I'd be interested in your, your opinion on the, uh, what they call the showroom, where I go in and I, I go to a Best Buy and I barcode scan it and buy it from Amazon. 
right, right there in Best Buy store. There's a lot of formats. Certainly, they're they're looking to roll that out. Um, my prediction that, that you know um, certainly uh, uh, Walmart setting it that way with these smaller 5,000 square foot formats um, or, or, or 15 that are going to look a lot like a Walgreens and Walmart that offer a much limited selection. But they, you know they, they already have the distribution set up so you can get it even that day. Um, and I would be very surprised. This is a prediction, so I don't have any research on this, but um, that Amazon won't open up some um, some bricks and mortar locations uh, that would have that opportunity. No question about it. They have. I mean, they have the distribution channel set up. Um, storefront is fairly inexpensive, and, and they can certainly pick a scale that makes sense. This is uh, obviously another trend. Um, you know, more importantly, of all, but we're seeing uh, this application at, even at the regional level. Um, I didn't actually order these, but you can get online now and order custom jeans, custom shirts. You can pick the, you know, the striping on your shoes, and so this this opportunity of being able to customize your your retail products or experiences is starting to become uh, a very popular trend. Um, so um, I, I need a new laptop bag, and I could have gotten it with the green stripe or plain black, and you know, depending on how conservative you want to be. Um, so it's, it's, I think this is going to be continuing to trend and we're certainly following those retail brands that, that, are, that are picking this up and giving that flexibility to the customer base. And then I think interesting, luxury is back, but this has a lot to do with the post-recession consumer. Prior to the recession, I think you know, a lot of people were more interested in, in just brands. If it had this brand, and, and, you know, there was a certain amount of appeal. Uh, but the customer is looking for quality. Um, they're expecting quality, but they're expecting the experience with the quality. So the operators that, that understand this and get this uh, are being rewarded. Um, but you can't just stick a brand on something and expect it to sell or work anymore. And so that's been the change. There's, there's a lot of uh, you know, practical decisions. And women especially, because they're the biggest uh, soft goods shopper, um, they're still buying high end goods. They're just not buying at the same amount of frequency. So instead of four times a year, they'll, they'll, they'll try to find um, opportunities to you know, buy things that they can make, mix and match or, or wear a couple of times. And um, so uh, there's a lot of focus on that. Um, I think eBay started this trend uh, in, in the furniture resellers, but actually um, vintage is something that we're seeing a lot more trends coming in. You know, you've got you know, kind of quasi vintage operators like Topshop. Um, just opened up in Chicago in anthropology, but we're even seeing these vintage kind of resale shops um, that are really niche come out in, in the old town type environments. So that's been fun to watch, and they're doing very well. Um, and then you get into categories um, such as specialty retail. You know, Apple is certainly a great example, or Wegmans grocery stores in the Northeast. Um, but I wanted to throw in a couple. Um, Trader Joe's, we spent a lot of time here um, on their entry. Um, you know, really excited to see them. Their customer, it looks a lot like a Panera customer. So if you want to try to correlate what a Trader Joe's customer looks like, you can go back to the, the Panera slide. There's a lot of correlation between a Trader Joe's and a, and a, and a Panera customer base. And then I also wanted to use an example of, of Babes. Um, I'm not a great fan of the food and quality, but uh, as, you know, as a lot of people are, they're doing about 350,000 meals uh, a year out of most of their stores and their regional uses. So you don't necessarily have to track an Apple store um, to get that success. I would even consider Babes and some of these unique niche operators as a, as a specialty retailer. So what can we look for uh, in 2011? Um, pay a lot of attention to you know, the markets that have low unemployment and have you know, the right demographics and the job growth. Um, I like the slide, Texas got uh, two of the top uh, 10 states as it relates to uh, average monthly spending. So we pay, we pay a lot of attention to not necessarily this type of propaganda, but really the statistics behind it from a micro level of you know, what is the spending propensity, what is the disposable income, what is availability, what are, you know, what's going on kind of in the region from a job growth standpoint. And then even at the household level, um, what different household types are spending categorically um, and looking at what's available so that you can really start to start predict the amount of demand that might be available in certain nuances or, or areas. So is the household spending the first thing you look at? Um, household spending income is, is a big component. We, we actually look at, the, look at um, about 20 different variables. I'm sure you do, but 
What's the first thing you look at? I'm sure there's a lot of different population mm -hmm. first. Okay. Just people. Yes. And then comes second. Okay. In any in, in, in any retailer model, population income. I know it's made up a lot of different things. Okay. And then from a retailer perspective, like for for instance, uh, CC's Pizza, I want to look at population. That's it, but daytime population, lunch. Right. I mean, so every retailer goes after their unique. Right. And in mean, every retail, there's some retailers that have different formats that cater to even different segments. So you might have an urban, you know, operator, a 7-Eleven, and yeah. pretty much will operate across all tiers, and they want they look at you know population density. And, and really traffic patterns. They want to be on the apex of a market and the path of ants. So, um, you, know, they're, they're, you know, every retailer is certainly different, but in population income are, are big. Can you pop back a slide? Uh, you mentioned one more. Washington, D.C., number one, but at the same time you said you're looking at unemployment, right? They're over 10%. Right, right, right. Well, there. So I would consider them not necessarily, I mean, yeah, they've got a huge number there. What, what's driving? That low, or that high, un, high relative high unemployment, put them on this list. Well, you have to put this also in perspective of cost of living. You know, so they're, I mean, they're spending more per capita per household, but they have a higher cost of living too, and they have higher income. So you, you can't look at one statistic and say, you know, that's it. I'm, I'm running with it. And those neighborhoods there are very second. Right. She did plug said that they also had the number one payroll in the country. Yeah. 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 Highest year. I have a salary. A retailer's going to look at that and ask the same question why. Um, I'm, I've done deals in DC and I'm looking at that and I'm going to guess it's because there's two people in the household working, making good money. Right. Yeah, that's, that's, a, that's a part, I mean, it's certainly part, of it. it's insightful, but it's not actionable. And then there are segments of that, in the city and it's up there that are just blacks. Right. Yeah, right. And that's everywhere. When I, yeah, but when I was up there, it was just such a, the dichotomy was so. There's no like middle class there. It's yeah, you're right. Either it's, it's surprising, isn't it? it? I mean, it's very stark difference. That's why I think it's important when you develop your strategy to look at things in, in, in a very micro economy. You know, if you're you know, if you're looking at Old Town, just look at Old Town and try to put the ingredients in perspective, because that's going to be totally different than than, than, the, a court than the correct court or or even you know at you know the, the Interstate 35 and Main Street or really even mid block between here and, and Interstate 35 would be kind of a different program um, because the ingredients, the drivers, and, and, and a lot of things are different. I think the Washington permit, but they also benefit from a fairly high transient. No question. <laughs> it's a completely different market. I mean. Um, and then, as you're putting together kind of a recruitment plan, um, ultimately, what what part of what we do is to start to run the analytics and, and, and let some of these operators go to the top and figure out you know, from a probability standpoint. But capital expenditure also has a big part, and so we we track and monitor um, the brands and their expansion plans because the probability of getting a subway that's going to open up 4,000 stores is a whole lot greater than the probability of capturing a Chipotle that may only open up 150 stores nationwide, or Target this year that's only going to open up 15. You know, you have to be one of the top 15 markets in the United States in order to capture a Target. Um, so we spend a lot of time tracking um, not only retailers, retail requirements, um, but capital expenditures and expansion plans because all that has, it comes into play. Um, Rudy's Barbecue is a great operator um, in the right area, but they can only they don't have, they only have the operations to open up maybe one or two stores a year locally at best, and so even though the ingredients may be there, you may be on the pecking order, uh, you know, for year three or four from now, just because they just don't have the capital expenditures and the operations to, to the velocity to get there quick enough. Or, or I assume Dollar General, Family Dollar. Dollar Tree are all separate companies? Yes, right. Yeah, and this is just a list of some. This is an example. But all the dollar stores are, they're all independently owned, separately owned. We, we, we they track, know each other well. We, we track about 8,000 different locations and over you know, 4,000 brands. So, you know, there's, there's, there's a lot of these nuances, but you know, these, these are the, the major categories, the national guys that you would what's, recognize. What's the trend there that's going on? Trying to siphon off Walmart. You talk about the dollar stores? Yeah, 
Well, I know that I'll let you talk in a second, but a lot of that is, yes, Walmart's a big deal, but all of a sudden, they are, they make it, the owners of, that, of those companies are very, very wealthy, and the entry barrier for them is very, very low. And so they can open up a store relatively inexpensively because they go off, they don't take good real estate. They don't have to. And people will find them. And they have no, if you look at their stores, there's not very many of them that have good building aesthetics. Because they don't have to. That's, it's a very The reason they don't have to be fun is because of the economy. That's part of it. But um, I know them a lot because I've done a lot of work in the southeast where they're headquartered. And they're everywhere. But it's like Dairy Queens over here. They're everywhere in the southeast. And now they just, they're expanding because they can. It's their time. Right. They're, they're time. getting a lot of closeouts and right. stuff that aren't main sellers. So they so they problems. Big lots, too. Correct. Right. all three of them have kind of focused on the lease opportunity. Not necessarily. They have some, they have the developers will come in and build for them, and then the developers will sell it. They're just not, um, from a developer standpoint, please step in if I'm stepping on your toes, but we know some of them. Building a Dollar General store is roughly the same as building a CVS Walgreens. It's the same processes, but the developer building a Walgreens will have a more difficult time because of where they have to sell the land, but the rewards are so much greater. Uh, when you do a dollar general store, you don't make as much money. You just don't. Right. The B locations and the B operations. And then we spend a lot of time tracking, um, you know, store growth. And, and I won't get into each one of these. Off. I'll be more than happy to provide the data um, behind this. But we spend a lot of time just tracking, you know, store growth this year versus last year, and trying to understand, you know. What are the differences and the nuances in, in each one of these individual brands? So we will track apparel, um, you know, looking at, at, at grocery, um, you know, the discount stores. You can see um, you know, a lot of changes increase in those continually. Um, the department store growth uh, obviously is, is uh, starting to, to slow um, continually. Um, Sears is actually negative growth, and then um, obviously the trend. We talked a little bit um, about some of the national expansion, but um, Panera has gone from, and I'm going to continue to pick on Panera. Panera has gone from 4,500 square feet uh, down to 3,750 on a floor plan, and getting the same yield or even higher yield out of the smaller floor plan for from operational efficiencies. And so the national brands are obviously looking at ways to reduce their occupancy costs, and so they're finding efficiencies in um, in store layout, or um, they're removing some of the lower margin items and reducing their floor plan floor plans nationwide. And so what you're doing is you're seeing some surplus space, you know, on the edge of Best Buys. You're starting to see you know, little leasing signs on the side of Best Buy, um, making the 5,000 square feet available. And then they're also going to these little 5,000 square foot kiosks instead of having the big 20 or 25 or 30,000 square foot stores. Um, they're finding much smaller stores, but they're scalable so they can penetrate, you know, greater market mass. And so um, there's definitely a, a big national trend in, in uh, national brands reducing their floor plans. And then we uh, spend a lot of time looking at, um, even more on a local basis, the distribution of uh, shopping center types and, 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 and the demand for certain goods and services and the tenants, in, in essence, occupy um, in, in these different shopping centers. And then if you look going forward, um, we're seeing um, most of the growth occurring in these lifestyle centers for the same reasons that I told you earlier. Um, you know, they offer this placemaking, kind of a higher end. Uh, goods and services, and then you can even mix uh, Highland Village. You can even mix in local uh, neighborhood goods and service oriented businesses within those environments. Um, but, but there's certainly an opportunity for place making um, that's appealing. Uh, power centers, I think, are going to continue to be relevant just because they can offer um, uh, you know, low, uh, lower margin or lower price goods um, in that format. And I, th I think neighborhood centers you're going to see continue to increase um, in, in demand and number. Um, but I think the format has to, I think there's got to be placemaking components in that neighborhood environment for that to really work work well. So um, what that would look like is maybe a pharmacy with a bank and an integrated strip center, but uh, maybe a little bit increased common area, um, integrated in a bike or trail plan um, with a fountain 
And again, you don't have to overdo it, but I think just pulling in some place making and some new urbanism concepts yeah, concepts into the into the neighborhood environment. Could you describe, I guess, or define the lifestyle center? There's definitely a gross leasable area uh, difference from a size standpoint, but it's really how it's merchandised. So a lifestyle center would be South Lake Town Square or Highland Village, the overall concept, uh, open air um, type it, environment, it, like walkable, seatable right. yeah, like space with shop. It's How's almost it entertainment just house? walking around. It makes you feel a bit of too much. Destination location, I think it was talking about. By, by pure definition, a power center is, is, is by the anchor. Um, so you'll have usually a general merchandiser or a, a big box anchor or maybe a pendant with a grocery store. So it's formatted differently. Target. 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 You know, public policy issues, so zoning, what you can and can't do, and a lot of times those conflict with you know the market demand um, or even a merchandising strategy. And then obviously the tenants are trying to control their own destiny and protect market share and trying to unravel um, uh, you know these co-tenancy clauses or even exclusive uses can be you know very complicated, very different, difficult. You might describe what those are. Right. Uh, I'm still didn't hear the word. What was it called? Co-tenancy. Co-tenancy. Co okay. It's an agreement that if on your lease that you, your lease is associated. Having someone else's lease active in the store there. If they leave, you get a chance to opt out. When I was a retailer, I would, and a developer would come and say, I want you, Starbucks or whatever, in my shopping center. I would say, okay, I want co tenancy and I want non exclusive. Nobody else can sell these products. Here's a list. And I want these people here. If any of those things change, I have to approve it or else I get remedy. Be it like leave, I can do whatever I want. Not whatever I want. That's what's big box stores. Right. right. Yeah. So is Firewheel a power center or a lifestyle center? So it's a hybrid, but in, in hybrid. essence, it's, it's, it's really truly a, a, a mall, uh, but it, it would be considered kind of a quasi lifestyle center. To that, are you, and I'm just curious, uh, this, so I've always heard that's what will happen, but mm -hmm. are you seeing any uh, movement back to the malls from the lifestyle center? The reason I ask that is I noticed this last year's first time I've ever seen it. During the high point of Christmas shopping, there were a lot of ads and there were stores like TJ Maxx was one of them and I can't remember there was three or four stores and they're not located in malls usually. They're located out in lifestyle centers or in the uh, power center or the neighborhood center. And it would say leave the malls, come to us and shop their, their commercial for it. And that's what it was, get out of the mall and it showed them with their shopping bag and they had their store's names on those shopping bags. And it, to me, if they're needing to advertise to get people to leave the malls and do that, I wonder if people are starting to go back to the malls. Plus, I talked to, and I was going to ask you anything about that, I talked to uh, one of the head dogs, I don't miss his name, at Jason Penny, and I asked him about building outside of the mall. He said, we would much rather, we would, and of course this is, they just had a new thing opened up yesterday, I don't know what happened. I was waiting to see, but he said we'd much rather be located and positioned in a mall than we would a lifestyle or free scene. We have much better performance in our malls. He said the problem is nobody's building malls. Right. If when we need to expand, we got to expand. They're just not building malls. He said our profit margin is much better inside a mall than they are free scene. Right. Right. So yeah, I mean definitely the trend is is I mean, it hasn't there hasn't been any enclosed malls built six years or, or something. So there's a lot you know. Get more formats like um, Garland Firewheel um, for, for a number of reasons. Um, uh, and we're really, some of this is a cultural shift. Uh, some of it has to do with how they're, how they're programmed. Um, operating expenses are different. Um, so I mean, there's a lot, a lot of flexibility in the brand. So there's a lot of reasons why the you know, open air centers work. Um, I'm not opposed to them. You know, we live in the market with one of the best malls in the nation. I mean, North Park does phenomenally well and has figured out a, a way to continually remain relevant. Um, and we use a lot of Derek's strategies. Derek Wood is the guy that's in charge of leasing at North Park Mall. We use a lot of his strategies. I mean, he knew, um, I remember going to a presentation before they kicked off the redevelopment. He knew exactly who he was going to pursue once they redevelop in a, in a kind of a packing order on performance, how to regroup them, and how to merchandise, re-merchandise them all and, and get that efficiency out of it. 
Um, but it was a very scientific approach, and, and so you know those techniques can be applied to different. Did you not see any movement back to that? Not, not yet. No. Not yet. Yeah, it's just so expensive. Thing too, if you read his article, he knew what his clientele was, and he catered to. No that question. Oh, yeah. No question. That's what he, no he knew. What he wanted for clientele, he catered to that population. And he knew the number one guy in that you know in that category that you know could fill the gap and deliver the highest foot traffic and um, deliver the most energy. You know, you know. And I, I guess if you look at it from a you know, broker's agenda or developer's agenda, and the broker gets paid on a deal regardless of the quality of the tenant, right? It's usually based on the value of the land transaction or you know how much that tenant can afford to pay in rent, not necessarily quality. Um, and the developer, you, most developers, uh, and I ran the re retail division for Lucy Billingsley, um, they had more of an MPV strategy, but 90% of the developers have an internal rate of return where it's just time. And a faster time, um, has much more implications than, than the overall margin. And um, so developers generally are, is, is, they're careful from a long-term strategy, but they would rather take a Chili's over a Cheddar's if Chili's was ready to, ready to go, although the sales difference between Chili's and Cheddar's is about uh, twice as much for Cheddar's from a, from a sales performance. So, you know, the strategies are different, but I think it's important that you, you know, uh, to really pay attention to the quality, um, and that's exactly what North Park Mall did, is they knew from a quality standpoint, and a revenue, and a value, and a foot traffic, in the exact order who they wanted to pursue. And they didn't always get the number one guy, but they would go to the number two guy, or hold out and wait and try to deliver the number one guy in other categories until that other number one guy came into place. So. And what we do, which we'll get to later, every community, every shop, every community needs to know who they are. And a lot of times they don't know that they, they want to, for instance, one of our clients said, we want a central market. Well, you're not going to get one. This is why, but you can get a Sprouts. And so a Sprouts went there. What we do is we identify who should be interested. And so yeah, don't put your energy into things that aren't going to, that aren't you, that aren't going to come. Most cities do that. That's a big deal. Or, or you pay for it by bridging the gap through some sort of economic program. It's usually temporary. Exactly. Yeah, it is. It's not usually sustainable. Yes, yes, I ask you a question about neighborhood centers. How much of that, because I see it trending up with you know, the thing, up, thing else up there, how much of that looks like the more traditional neighborhood centers we've seen, and how much of that is urban village, new urbanism? Um, probably 2% new urbanism and 98% traditional. Okay. Um, but I think there's an opportunity there. I, I really do, and I think long term that will be rewarded. So that, that's kind of my own biases. But I think you can integrate some of the new urbanism practices and things that are making the lifestyle centers work on a smaller format, and get and get and get re rewarded for it. And I think it doesn't necessarily have to be looked at from a cost as a development perspective if you integrate it in with the right design for some principles and kind of the right mix. So I'm going to go through real quick. And we we talked a lot about uh, kind of place making, but. Um, these are some of the characteristics. So, if you're kind of scoring, you know, your community, these are some of the uh, characteristics. Um, this was a national uh, uh, primary research done by the Knights Foundation, and I'll be more than happy to get you a copy. But again, this is a good read as you're developing Old Town in some of these areas. Um, some of the characteristics that you look for. But, um, in, 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 in Richard, Florida, obviously, uh, kind of is paralleling some of these from an openness standpoint. You'll see some of these characteristics. Um, you know, his other ones are more tolerance, but you'll see um, kind of an eclectic mix. I mean, if you look at Uptown, you know, what makes Uptown really works is there's, there's that openness or kind of eclectic population base. You get a little bit of everything, um, young and old, you know, black and white, um, and, and so on and so forth in, in preference. And then and also we talk about aesthetics, um, but if you look at what, at least what the population characters are looking for um, is certainly aesthetics um, when you're involved in place making. And um, this is a, a, a project that we looked at with uh, Scott Polikoff, um, who you guys may be familiar with from a, from a planning standpoint, but how before we looked at things from a use standpoint, the planning and zoning, and then ultimately um, kind of argued about form. Um, when you get into you know, some of the characteristics and some of the planning that you've done in Old Town, where you can actually mitigate risk by kind of designing the form and get, getting the um, uh, land use policies in place and kind of letting the market move with uh, so, uh, one example, and we talked a little bit about Rono as a case study, and I'll move through this very quickly. This was the original um, phase. It was doing about 350,000 deals a year. This is what it looked like in 2003. 
the city looked at, um, in essence, kind of the district and the, the cultural characteristics and uh, did a market analysis and said, if we can uh, bring in a certain amount of infrastructure and investment, um, I think in this case it comes in about $8 million, you know, would that yield a favorable return? Say that again. $8 million. $8 million. Yeah, very short block. So they looked at you know the characteristics and, and uh, really worked on kind of defining the district and you know what the the, uh, the building scale and types might look like. And if you go back and look at um, to, uh, this last year, this is a look uh, uh, at the end of, uh, of 2011. So far from 2003, they've got 50,000 square feet of net new commercial. Um, the restaurants there, uh, the collective commercials, uh, yielding about 12 and a half million dollars in gross sales with roughly um, $250,000 a year. So if you go back to the original estimate, um, they're actually, and I'll show you a slide that shows that, they're actually um, hurtling above that. But they've got a developer that now is looking at another 40 acres at the south end of town, bringing another mixed use concept, and a significant amount of retail operators are already in play in addition. So I think um, even my prediction of 10 to 20% growth a year on the 250 number, um, they could actually end up doubling that number in the next two or three years with just what's on the table uh, being discussed. Half a million in, in, in that uh, sales tax. So, what was the year that, I know you said 2003, that's what you figure, but what was the year they, let's say, finished the street improvements and had the first store change finished? I believe that was in 06. Okay, so they've had the new street and then the first store so, finished by 06 and then it's gone for them. Okay. About a five year. Okay. And what's interesting, from a retailer standpoint, most retailers, most niche retailers have been watching this, and as it gets more successful, other people are going to jump in. All right. Although, can I add that in their initial retailers, especially restaurants, the city provided the fairly large incentive for those guys to come in. They were still the restaurants. Was that, that was in addition to the 8 million? Yes. Yes. They had five year for forgivable yeah. lines. They had yeah. different That's tiers. Exactly what they had to do. So yeah, I mean, if you look at 250 on the 8 million investment now, I mean, do the math, but it's, it's but, but I, I think you'll see that double in the next two or three years. Uh, in the next, yeah, so I think they can you know, reduce that horizon. It's, it's not the 10-year window that we usually look at, but it was a catalyst investment uh, uh, in, that, in a true sense that, in essence, has spawned you know, if you really you know, did the, measure the indirect and the direct impact, it, it starts to pencil out pretty quick. It's not like there's another place to go very close by. Have you been there? Have y'all ever been to Rona? Uh, so so you've seen the market. Yeah. So it, it's rocking. Yeah, it is. Yep. Again, it's, it's not like something, another place that people go away. Right, you know, right. I mean, it is the place in the area. It, it, it could have easily continued to be the way it was, though, without any public intervention. No and question, say no that, question about that's it. That's true. Could have, but that's I mean, they right. did this in a down economy. They did this in an economy right. when nobody was making investments on anything. Right. And we've actually tracked a lot of the uh, trade area. That we got people from all over hell driving up there for the, ex the experience. I was going to say, you've got within just a few minutes, you've got within 10 minutes, max, you've got the grapevine, you've got uh, Capel. You got, further than that. You've got Fort Worth. Keller's got a couple of areas you can you go got in. Fort Worth, the north part of Fort Worth down there. There's a 10 minute ride. You jump on 35 there, and yeah. you're down to that. What's that area just below or just south of the Limestone Center? Yeah, it's all that area North there. Well, there's a lot of other choices there, but I think it goes back to what he was saying. People look to that place. place and and the energy. Not yet. <laughs> well, they, that's a great idea. <laughs> they do serve better light. Uh, I'm not going to go through the statistics, but uh, the before and after, this is, this is what the, you know, if you go back to 03, you know, this is what the investment looks like. And then this is um, kind of a, a layout of at least the current restaurants in, in play. And, and I love this picture of all the people waiting in line on Friday night. What's the uh, icon there for what places? Uh, classic cafe oh. and tortilla flags. Oh. Miss the German restaurant. Yeah. Did you say there's there, there are bars and restaurants in there? Okay. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, every restaurant down there. Twisted Root, as a member. Cabo Chow. Yeah, there's, there's a lot of offsetting there. No. And so I think it'd be interesting to look at at least 
from our perspective, um, how all this came together. And you had you had Bates already there. I mean, it was a first mover advantage. Um, he knew his market. Um, it was in, you know, the Decatur market and started growing the Bates concept. And was here turning out, you know, 350,000 meals a year. And you know, lines on Friday and Saturday, the word gets out. So I mean, the, you know, eventually the secret gets out to other restaurant operators that hey, there's for, for whatever reason, it doesn't look very good on paper, but there's a market here. They started this in 2003. Correct. There wasn't a down copy then. Mm, well, you were kind of on the back side of the L1. So, I mean, you, 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 it, it wasn't necessarily viral. I, I, I know that September 9-11 right. went down, and things happened because of that event, but it really didn't start going down until like 2007, right. 2008. But the, but the activity, a lot of the activity and the increase has happened. Through, through the recession. So the investment was made pre-recession, but a lot of the activity even since then, they had growth even through the recession. So the growth has gone through the, right. through the downturn right. the economy. Yeah. Like I said, the first one was over 2006, but all that growth was due during the downturn of the economy. Right. People, people were turning off the taps at the end of 06. Right. So yeah. stopped everything. Yeah. Um, but but when this goes back to the firmographics of the workforce. What really made this work is Alliance. You had you know, 17,000 jobs. Um, you had significant amount of rooftops and, and as you guys mentioned there was, there was the void in places to really eat so I mean, there was the, the market was certainly there and so what we did recently is that we went out and actually um, did a plate study plate scan and uh, interviews and started tracking where the heck you know, are these people come from that are going to Roanoke and you start to um, you know understand the nuances of where you know where they're pulling and where the customer behavior is and so if you're going to set up a merchandising strategy, you start to understand where your consumer base is coming from, and with with this data, then you can start to get insight on you know the housing and the type of residents and and, and beyond just the workforce. Again, some of those ingredients for, for success, or what are, what are the nuances, or what are the, what are the uh, uh, demographics look like within the, the ingredients? Can I can I ask you? So you went out and actually you surveyed people that came to that area to determine this large trade area. Correct. Yes. Okay. Correct. So so this this is actually this is this is not a ten minute drive. This is people are coming from this area in a specific statistical amount. That's correct. It's okay. very it's a, it's just so and I'm for you guys that you, you sound like you're fairly familiar with it, but our process would be go out and, and interview the customers or get point of sales information where we can, or we take the license plate and get a, a household address from that, that plate information. And we plot it all on a map, and then we eliminate the last 5% as outliers, just as a conservative measure. And then we took the closest 65% of those remaining samples to define this geography. And this is a, this is a way uh, Panera or Whole Foods or Walgreens, um, in essence, define their trade areas, a statistical version just like this. Um, Walgreens might use 100% of their samples. You know, they, they may use 100% of their samples as their market just because they have they trade in such a small area. And they might get the majority of those in a four and a half minute drive time, very compact area, or three mile range. Um, we look at it, this was actually done through census tract, but you could do the same process, look at what, what is the drive time that captures 65%, or what is a concentric ring, which is which is this the circle, what is a concentric ring that captures just the close to 65%. So this Would you say that the bigger that ring is? more likely to place as a destination. No question. Yeah. And one of the things we mentioned earlier, how some of the other reports were doing studies and they, they said it was a 10 mile ring or a 